Washington Journal continues. We want to welcome back to C-SPAN Michael Schweier, who is the former CIA bin Laden unit chief. Uh, good morning. Thanks very much. Good for morning, being with sir. Us. Thank you for having me. We want to talk about some of these documents uh, that were released last week, but let's begin with some of the news of the day. And here's how it's playing out on a couple of leading newspapers: The Daily News, Evil on Trial, and Whining 9/11 Fiends Turn Terror Trial into a Circus. Some other headlines from the Baltimore Sun: The 9/11 Defendants Stay Mute. From the, below the fold in the Washington Post, detainees refuse to speak in the 9-11 arraignment. And some details this morning, front page of the New York Times. Amid disruptions, both passive and aggressive, the government's attempt to restart its efforts to prosecute the five defendants in the long-delayed September 11th case got off to a slow and rocky start in a trial that ultimately uh, could result in their execution. The next hearing is set for mid-June, and the trial not expected to start for at least another year. What's going on? Well, they're going to use this as a forum to demonstrate that American justice is ridiculously biased toward Muslims. That's what's going on here. And I think what we'll see is episodes of silence and then episodes of, unfortunately, probably pretty um, uh, uh, eloquent Arabic to talking to the Muslim world about uh, the, the, the problems with American um, justice. I think that's what we're seeing. In, in many ways, it's a self-imposed problem. We have insisted now for 15 years that these people are not uh, somehow prisoners of war. And we, we, you get what you pay for. And now we're, we've given them a forum into the uh, 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 ju judicial system, and they will take advantage of it, again, as you said, either passively or aggressively. And, of course, this is uh, the trial that originally the White House had considered moving to New York City. That, of course, was quickly nixed, even by Senator Chuck Schumer and uh, the mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg. Would that have changed anything? Probably would have made it worse, because the military at least has a bit an ability to keep some decorum in the courtroom. Uh, in a federal court, it would have been a circus. There would have been Muslims or uh, supporters outside. There would have been opponents outside. There would have been a disruptive crowd inside. You know, I think the safest thing for America would have been just to declare these people prisoners of war, put them in a stockade, and let us decide when the war is over. No trial. So as this continues, as we indicated, the next hearing will be in June. The trial itself is at least a year away. Yes. And, and uh, you know, Ram Ramsey bin al-Shib yesterday raised the possibility. He said, don't think I'll commit suicide. If I die, it'll be because the Americans killed me before the before the trial could come about. And so they're very clever people, sir. We make a mistake when we think we're fighting a rabble. These people know our system very, very well, and they're trained to fight the jihad, not only on the battlefield, but from the courtroom. The leader in all of this, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, looks uh, quite different today than he was when he was uh, captured about six months after 9-11 in Pakistan. He does indeed. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, through his early career, through 9-11, was really kind of a raconteur, uh, a cosmopolitan guy, someone who uh, was anything but what we would think of as a, of, a, of a good Muslim. He was a traveler and a drinker and a womanizer, and he seems to have found the, the, the straight and narrow in prison. Our phone lines are open. Michael Shoyer is going to be with us uh, for the next 40 minutes as we talk about these new documents on Osama bin Laden. You can also join the conversation on our Twitter page or send us an email, journal at cspan.org. Let's go to these documents, and these are the writings of bin Laden, as uh, found from U.S. and uh, Western uh, officials who were inside Pakistan. He said this about the president. The president is the head of infidelity, and killing him automatically will make Vice President Biden take over the presidency for the remainder of the term, as it is the norm over there. Biden is totally unprepared for that post, which will lead the U.S. into a crisis. Yeah, they, they, they were afraid of Obama at first because he made uh, the speech in Cairo. Uh, he made a couple of other speeches that looked like we were changing our policy in the Middle East. And so they were very eager to get rid of him. But um, I think until bin Laden died, they had backed off a little bit on that because, uh, uh, as in most cases, words weren't followed by deeds by the, the American government in terms of our policy in the Middle East. Joseph Ramirez wondering this, uh, how big was getting bin Laden? Oh, it was very big, I think. I think if you read the documents, and the documents are in a way odd. There are 17 of 6,000, as I understand it, and there's only four in the package of 17 that were written by bin Laden. But I think when you read those documents written by him, you come, across, you come away with the idea that there is no incompatibility between a 7th century religious zealot and a 21st century CEO. 
it's a vi they're a very impressive small group of letters, very consistent with his attitude since 1988. Uh, and so I think it's very important that we kill them. There was a very steady hand at the tiller, a very intelligent hand at the tiller, um, ready to, you know, he had established uh, an order by which the jihad, if you will, will should proceed. First was to attack the Americans and drive us as far out of the Middle East, then go after the Arab tyrants and Israel, and then go after the Shia. And he tried to maintain that, uh, in, at least in these documents, to keep the focus on what you call the head of, it, or quoted, the head of infidelity. Well, let's go back to that. Again, these are the words of bin Laden. He said, quote, and we have to remember another important issue, which is that the jihad in Afghanistan is a duty to establish the rule of Allah, which is Sharia law, in it, and it is the path toward conducting the larger duty, which is liberating the one and a half billion person nation and regain its holies. What is he referring to? What he's referring to in Islam is that the, 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 what they call the caliphate, the one Islamic entity around the world that wouldn't have uh, uh, borders, it's just one group of Muslims, has to start from somewhere, has to start from a geographical position. And what they viewed uh, Afghanistan before 9-11 was, was the start of that, was a base from which to build the caliphate. And now they believe that when we go, and we've said we're going, they, the Muslims under Mullah Omar, the Islamists, will take power again, which is very likely. And then you have your land base, the place to start from. So Afghanistan is very important. It doesn't seem to me there's, there's very much realization within the American government in either party about how important the law are, are get, getting beaten in Afghanistan is. I know this has been the most often asked question over the last 10 years, but I'm interested to get your perspective. What motivates anyone to go on a suicide mission, including those involved in the planes that hit the World Trade Center, and to do so for bin Laden? What kind of power, what kind of control, what kind of charisma did he have uh, that motivated these individuals to do what they did, and also those that remain in Guantanamo for the last 10 years? I think there's two answers to that, or a two-part answer. The first is bin Laden was an entirely unique individual. Um, there's a lot of people who talk the talk, but not everybody who does walks the walk. Bin Laden gave up the life of a billionaire to fight along the Muj aside the Mujahideen against the Soviets. He was wounded in action. He is a man of extraordinary personal skills, interpersonal skills, if you will, and uh, uh, really was lived the life that he preached. And in the Muslim world where poverty is so endemic, the idea that a man gave up a, a billionaire's lifestyle to join the, the Mujahideen is an extraordinary come on. What, what causes them to drive planes into the World Trade Center? Well, if you believed uh, President Bush or President Clinton or President Obama, it was because they hated women in the workplace and beer and uh, elections in Iowa every four years, which is a nonsense. It was a nonsense in 1996. It's a nonsense now. What motivates these people is they believe they're fighting for their faith. And whether we agree with that or not is largely irrelevant. They believe their faith is under attack by U.S. foreign policy and by the foreign policy of our allies whether it's support for the Saudi police state, it's our presence on the Arabian Peninsula, our bombing of Libya and Yemen, our support for the Israelis. These are substantive issues. And, and we have a, an odd situation where uh, the United States government, bipartisanly, uh, identifies the motivation of our enemy as kind of ephemera. They hate women going to school. And the enemy tells us repeatedly, we don't care how you live in North America. What we care about is getting you out of our backyard. So the drive of these people is both the inspiration of bin Laden the person, but also a very widespread belief, not in al-Qaeda, but in the idea that U.S. foreign policy is an attack on Islamic civilization. We'll get to your calls in just a moment. One other uh, excerpt from the, the words of bin Laden. This on his legacy, he said, he who does not make known his own history runs the risk that some in the media and among historians will conduct a history for him using whatever information they have regardless of whether their information is accurate or not. Yeah, he's very, he's very conscious of getting the truth out about himself. He, he resented, for example, as I understand it at least, um, the, the, um, the book by Larry, uh, I can't remember his last name, but it was a biography of Bin Laden, The Looming Tower because really there was goofy stuff in there about him being the agent of Zawahiri and being a pliable, untalented man. So bin Laden very often tried to get out his own story, 
the uh, journalists like the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the London uh, newspaper editor, Abdul Bari Atwan, or the journalist Robert Fisk. Uh, so it's a, uh, you know, the other thing is, the, uh, I think a more current example and probably a more important one at this moment is when the Arab Spring occurred, uh, everybody put words into uh, bin Laden's mouth and Al-Qaeda's mouth that this is the end for them, this is, they'll hate this because the people are rising up and overthrowing their government. And what's very clear in these, these documents is every journalist from the Washington Post to the New York Times to the Los Angeles Times to the Times of London were wrong. They rejoiced at the Arab Spring. Bin Laden called it the most important point in the modern history of Islam in reclaiming the Arab world, the Muslim world, for Islam. So, um, of course, there's no responsibility in bad for a bad analysis, but it's, uh, it should make a lot of people embarrassed when they read these things. And the author that you're referring to, Lawrence Wright? Yes, Lawrence Wright, yeah. Our phone lines are open. James is on the phone from Champaign, Illinois, for Michael Scheuer, formerly with the CIA, head of the Bin Laden unit. Good morning, Jim. Um, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, thank goodness for C-SPAN. My comment is basically this. I'm ex-military, and since World War II, which this country won in less than two and a half years, we haven't waged all-out war. We didn't do it in Korea. We piddled around in Nam for 10 years. We have piddled around in Afghanistan for 10 years. We pulled the same stunt in Iraq. What, if you want to stop terrorist attacks against this country, the very next time they hit us, we need a commander-in-chief that says, I want every troop from all 731 bases we have around the world. I want you to hit them, hit them hard, and don't quit hitting them until every last one of them is dead and decimated and gone. And if you do that one time, and the, these leaders of all these little terrorist groups around the world would look at each other and say, uh-oh, the Americans are actually serious. And a little crazy. I think you want both, sir. In, in many ways, I agree with you entirely. We uh, are dominated in our politics by multiculturalists and diversity people who think all people around the world are the same. In the Muslim world, uh, force is a lingua franca. The weak are taken advantage of, and the strong who don't use their power are even, are even more taken advantage of. And that's where we are. Our military, the strongest on the earth, has now lost two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, at least in the perception of the Muslim world to men armed with Korean War era weapons. Uh, the correct response to Afghanistan was a punitive expedition that it would, would have lasted about 15 months, destroyed as much as possible, and left all of the people there with the idea that the Americans were not only serious but a little crazy. And uh, that's the way to, to at least make your mark because right now our military is held in contempt except for the drones and air power and they're finding ways to get around those. So I think we in America have completely lost the idea of it's important to win. Uh, we're, we, we're willing to compromise on anything. Obama the other day, President Obama the other day said, uh, we didn't come here to beat the Taliban, which of course is 180 degrees different from what Mr. Bush said or what he said previously. But I agree with you, the, the, the military is meant to kill. It is not meant to dig ditches and wells. And until we use the military in the form it should be, um, we're in deep trouble. Our guest is Michael Scheuer, who spent uh, two decades at the CIA yes, and sir. headed up the bin Laden unit. How long did it take for you to determine that when those planes hit that bin Laden and al-Qaeda was behind 9-11? It, it was immediately apparent, sir. It didn't, you know, it wasn't a surprise. It was only within the senior bureaucracy that we had to wait a couple of days to figure out who was going to do it. We knew, we captured a computer in 1995, early in 1995, from Ramzi Youssef, the fellow who bombed the World Trade Center the first time in 1993. And in there was plans to train people on 747 airplanes. What caught our attention especially was that one of their top targets was the CIA headquarters at Langley. So um, there was no surprise when it came about, at so least amongst the intelligence community, sir. George is on the phone from Hudson, Florida. Good morning, Republican line. Good morning. Thank you, C-SPAN, for having people like Mr. Scheuer on the man. I respect this man tremendously. I, I You're very kind, him. sir. Thank you. And you don't, you don't pull any punches, which is great. Um, Mr. Mar Scheuer, I, I got one question for you. Who do you think is probably the most dangerous politician, Republican or Democrat, that we've had in the last 30 years that has helped um, 
expedite this thing with the terrorism and, and their attacks on the United States? Is it one person? Is it many? Who, sir, who's, who's responsible for this? Sir, I don't think there's a nickel's worth of difference between the two parties uh, in terms of foreign policy. Uh, pre first President Bush, Mr. Clinton, um, second Mr. Bush and Mr. Obama have all made it their business to lie to the American people to, to uh, uh, insist that somehow we're being attacked because of what we think here in North America or how we live rather than what the United States government has done. And the, the core of the problem is intervention in other people's business. Part of that intervention, unfortunately, is necessary. We have to defend the Saudis. We have to defend the Bahrainis because we depend on oil. Uh, but our support for Israel, our intervention in uh, the South Sudan, for example, the relentless intervention of the United States on issues that are not a very important to it uh, is the cause of what's going on. And it's a bipartisan stimulus. It's not just one person. And until we stop that, really, uh, or at least think about stopping it, uh, there's really no chance to start, stop this war. And that's why so much of al-Qaeda has spread so greatly since 2001. Our guest, Michael Shoyer, who is also the author of a number of books which we have featured on the C-SPAN networks, including Imperial Hubris, Why the West is Losing the War on Terror, and From Pandora's Box, America and the Militant Islam, after Iraq, we're discussing 17 letters released by bin Laden, uh, found uh, by the government, but uh, written by bin Laden from September of 2006 until just before his death in April of last year. Next is Den on the phone from Richmond, Virginia. Good morning. Thank you guys for taking my call. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, actually, uh, I studied at Virginia Tech, and uh, they mandatorily made us uh, read The Looming Tower. Uh, by Lawrence Wright, which is an excellent read. Uh, I just wanted to um, say just a real quick comment in the fact that uh, James from Illinois said that we need to uh, go in and bomb kind of a Colin Powell style um, uh, desert storm, but uh, I don't see there being enough where we can go to war enough that there's not going to be 19 people that's going to uh, send uh, 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 think, uh, airplanes into the tower. Um, so I, I, I feel like if we were to do that, that would maybe fan the resentment towards us. And, uh, and I just wanted to uh, see what your opinion was on that. Thank you. Well, I think that's true. I think any time you bomb someone, you don't win any friends. But the question is, ultimately, how do you defend the United States? And the problem for, for the U.S. military and for the American people generally is that their leaders from both parties are out in the Muslim world causing wars. Um, no one has been more responsible for the alienation of Muslims than, than Mrs. Clinton, uh, Ambassador Rice at the UN, and, and President Obama. The, it's odd in a sense that the war clash of civilizations, what Professor Huntington called the clash of civilizations, is really being waged by the United States. It's uh, Mr. Obama and Mrs. Clinton with the support of John McCain and Lindsey Graham who want to install secular democracy in, in Muslim countries, who want to insist on women's rights and installing them by force ready to see Marines die, if you will, in Afghanistan so Mrs. Mohammed can vote. I think until that kind of nonsense stops, we are creating wars. There's no way to cut the defense budget. There's no way to stop attacks on the United States. If you stopped intervening in other people's very internal and intimate affairs, then perhaps you could at least reduce the size of the threat. But until then, the only option we have is to kill them. And we're not doing that with efficiency or speed. Last week, though, in the president's speech uh, in Afghanistan, he said something that, that we don't want, America doesn't want to have a country, a mirror image, referring to Afghanistan, saying that we want the Afghan people to determine their own destiny. Well, that's what he said. He's changed his tune. And of course, uh, what, he has to say that because we're not, we don't intend to win the war there. Mr. Bush didn't intend to win the war there because it was too bloody a thing to do. But we're cutting and running. We're going to give the Muslim world the perception that the Americans can beat, get beat on the battlefield everywhere they go. And so he's going to say that kind of thing. It's a very political speech. The whole, the whole last week, it seemed to me a, to be a very tawdry use of the valor of American soldiers and intelligence officers. The leaking of all the information by John Brennan about how the drones operate, the surprise visit to Afghanistan, the, the, the publishing of these documents, all within about four days is surely not a coincidence. It was a tawdry political move 
One I suspect the Republican president would have also conducted. From our Twitter page, Mr. Schroyer, who is responsible for leading America to believe that bin Laden was hiding in caves all these years? There is uh, a tendency in contemporary America to have no respect for our enemies. And so Mr. Bush, uh, I think you have to assign that, that responsibility to Mr. Bush, but followed for a long while by Mr. Obama. Mr. Bush would say they're running from rock to rock and cave to cave. And as it turned out, bin Laden led a sedan, very sedentary life. And, and the reality of it for an intelligence officer, if somebody is running around from rock to rock and cave to cave and moving around a lot, you'll catch him because he'll make a mistake. The other thing they used to say was he couldn't communicate with his uh, organization because he was so isolated. First you had to wonder if they had been in a radio shack in the past 20 years. You can communicate with anyone on Earth if there's a satellite overhead. But it's important that these documents that came out make it very clear that uh, bin Laden in his isolation was very much aware of what was going on within the organization, not only in South Asia, but in Somalia, in Yemen, and in other places. Let's go back to your calls. Uh, Sylvan is on the phone from Silver Lake, Michigan. Good morning. Uh, good morning, sir. That's Sylvan, S-Y-L-V-A-N. Right. <laughs> uh, I completely agree with your guest there. I, I, the world doesn't really fear us anymore is one problem right there due to our rules of engagement and all this other kind of bunk. Uh, but they also, the Muslim world, uh, uh, everything that we do over here is strictly against the Koran. And uh, to them, we're infidels, and we all deserve to die. And that's how that is, that is played out. And thank you very much. Thank you for the call, Sylvan. Well, I think that's another popular misconception, and it's also one that's encouraged by the politicians because they don't want you to understand the problem. They want you to, uh, to be afraid and let them do what they want to do. Um, I, I would ask you that uh, why the United States hasn't been under constant attacks in 1776 by Muslims if, because we were, we were and are a, a Christian-dominated nation. Uh, if your argument is correct, we would have been attacked in 1824, and 1874, and 1924, and we weren't. Uh, what we're being attacked for is the, the, the post-1970-73 uh, expansion of U.S. intervention and uh, interference in the affairs of the Muslim world. And most of all, our support for the Israelis and our support for Arab tyranny. A follow-up on your view of the Bush and Obama foreign policies from a viewer self-described as right-wing. Obama foreign policy equals Bush policy with drones and apologies. I, th I think that's, uh, you know, uh, I don't think there's a lot of difference between President Bush and President Obama in terms of the mechanics of their foreign policy, except as the, as the writer says, there's a difference in, the, in their words. Bin Laden, when he was alive, was always more worried about Democratic presidents because they spoke more softly than Republicans. They weren't going to change anything, but they fooled a few Muslims. And so he always preferred Republicans because of their brash and harsh uh, rhetoric. Uh, but really, if you step back and you, you, you think that we spend uh, X numbers of hundreds of billion dollars on defense every year, and right now the defense of the United States is dependent on these little airplanes with, with one or two missiles on each one, trying to kill an enormous, enormous enemy one at a time, uh, it is, there is rather something comic about that. And another point from Sasha saying, how many years did uh, the president, President Bush, and uh, really the U.S. government pay Pakistan uh, with tongue-in-cheek to harbor bin Laden? We did provide Pakistan assistance. We did. You know, another, I think, uh, another failure of both parties, uh, of our political leadership, and it's in the Congress, it's in the executive, it's in the media, is to believe that every nation's foreign policy and national interests are the same as ours. It was never in Pakistan's interest to turn Osama bin Laden over to us. He was a uh, hero in the Islamic world. Uh, this, the Pakistanis are very close to the Saudis, and the Saudis never wanted Osama bin Laden in our hands because he knows where the skeletons are buried in the kingdom. And so you, you, you accept reality as it is. The Pakistanis helped us with overflight. They allowed. Karachi to become uh, basically a NATO naval base. There's no way to supply our military in Afghanistan without Karachi. We expanded our presence in their country. And Musharraf sent his army for the first time in Pakistan's history into the tribal areas to try to help us. And the result of that was a civil war on his own territory. So um, I think when you look at another nation, 
when you ask them to do something that is against their national interests, you really make a mistake that hurts you. Because they'll say yes, especially in the Muslim world, but they'll never do it. I want to go back, and we've been looking at this video of uh, bin Laden as he's watching cable television and has become almost a caricature yes. by uh, late night talk show hosts. But I'm wondering, in a more serious venue, what do you think he was thinking as he's monitoring CNN and other cable networks in a uh, enclosed room in Pakistan at his compound? Well, there was, is this the case where he was watching himself? That's right. That's yeah. right there. Bin Laden is a man who is very conscious, uh, or was a man, very conscious of the fact that he was not the best educated person in the world, especially in terms of um, uh, uh, religious theory and in, in, in grammar. So he was intent on appearing in the Muslim to Muslims as a very well-spoken, very presentable person. In some of these letters, he talks about the problem of Islamic uh, resistance leaders appearing in an unkempt fashion or talking on grammatically. So he may be admiring himself on that, but if the evidence we have available to us is correct, what he was doing was trying to make sure that what he was saying was grammatically correct and that he looked the part of a leader. We in the United States tend to forget that uh, the Muslim world, because so much of it is illiterate, is an overwhelmingly oral culture. And leadership comes from an ability to speak and speak correctly. So I can't say that he wasn't an egomaniac looking at himself, but the odds are, if you believe what we have in terms of evidence for the last 20 years, that what he was trying to do was to see what he did and see if there was room for improvement. We welcome our listeners on C-SPAN Radio, heard coast to coast on XM Channel 119. And Albert is next, a viewer from St. Louis, Missouri, with Michael Scheuer. Good morning. Well, thank you for your program and your guest. I'm just a little curious about his sta some of his uh, ideas. I don't say they're wrong, but if we're the proselyting autocrats over there on the Holy Land, these guys are moving en masse to the Western countries like England where they talk about putting Sharia law in place, but they don't have the numbers. And they come over here, do they, are, they, are they galvanizing us into their Holy Land? Are they misplaced into this den of iniquity that we call the modern West? I suspect there's a little bit of, of uh, heavy leaning on a group of religious uh, leaders, and I think that's who causes these problems. I have to ask you if you can verify that. But they're afraid of the West, uh, not so much of the oil and all this stuff, but their ideas and their thoughts that are contrary to Islam uh, corrupting their power. That seems to me to be the whole thing. It hasn't got much to do with all that other stuff, in my opinion, and I'm just a layman. Could I get your comments on that? I, I think uh, there is an increasing uh, worry in the Muslim world amongst the Islamists, whether it's al-Qaeda or its allies, that uh, certainly under Mr. Obama, that the intention to apply or to force Western values or paganism, depending on your view, on the Muslim world is a worry. But the one point I would make is one, two things. First, part of the problem we have with Islamic immigration or Muslim immigration comes from the absolute disaster of our immigration policy or the lack of an immigration policy. I think there's a very good argument to be made, or at least a debate to be had, that not all forms of Islam are compatible with American culture. It's just there's, they're at uh, sixes and sevens. But the other point I would make is it, it, what's too often forgot is that in, at least in this point in the Muslim world, Americans are not hated as Americans. Their government surely is hated. But Americans, in terms of their personal behavior, in terms of their personal generosity, the money we give and send when there's earthquakes in Pakistan or tsunamis in Indonesia, are, it's very welcome. And uh, most Americans, myself included, who have traveled in the Middle East and the Arab world and the Muslim world generally find that Americans are very welcome. But your hosts are always very conscious of asking, why are you giving F-16s to the Israelis to kill Palestinians? So if America ever got to the point where Americans were hated as much as their government, then we have a genuinely large problem, sir. As the Arab Spring was uh, taking place in Egypt and other parts of uh, the Arab world, bin Laden had this to say, quote, these events are the most important events that the nation has witnessed for centuries. 
It is known that comprehensive popular movements inevitably change the conditions. So if we double the efforts to direct and educate the Muslim people and warn them from uh, the half solutions while taking care in providing good advice to them, the onco uh, oncoming stage will be for Islam. Yeah. It's a, it was a very straightforward statement, and there are several statements within these letters to the same effect, that they welcome the, ad the advance of the Arab Spring. I think we need to remember, we talked at the beginning of the show, sir, that uh, uh, their, one of their goals was to get rid of the Arab tyrannies, to clear the way for Islam to become the ruling theory, the real ruling idea of government. And they found out they didn't have to do it themselves. Uh, the people rose up in places, uh, and the Islamists have won every election that has occurred since the Arab Spring began. And not only that, but the United States stabbed in the back the allies that it had depended on for decades. America and Western foreign policy in the Muslim world was built entirely on a strategy of maintaining eternal tyranny. And I think that was a wrong move from the beginning, but that was our policy. But when Egypt went and Tunisia went and then we helped Libya to go, um, we, we find ourselves now with about zero influence in the, across the Middle East. And certainly, if you look at Egypt, it's the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists that are driving the political process at the moment, something that is not going to result in anything but an Al-Qaeda-friendly government. For Michael Scheuer, this email from Carol Delory saying, why was bin Laden killed and not captured? I think if you, the papers, Steve, that you went over at the beginning are good evidence of why he had to be killed. Um, bin Laden would not have been either aggressive or passive. He would have been quiet but eloquent in a courtroom and would have talked to the Muslim world for years or as long as this trial went on. I think it was a very wise thing to kill him and not capture him. I think they botched the aftermath of it in terms of all the leaks and burying him at sea and all of that, that kind of thing. But I think they did make the right decision to kill him. How long do you think it will take before the photos of him before he was buried at sea show up? You know, I don't know why they don't release them. You and I can sit down any evening on TV and there, there can't be anything more gory than what we see on TV in the pictures of bin Laden. And, um, you know, the idea that they didn't want to inflame the Muslim world, well, worse than the pictures was burying bin Laden at sea because that's just not an acceptable uh, way of burial in the Muslim world uh, unless you actually die at sea. Next call is Joe from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Good morning. Morning. I really appreciate this show. Um, I had a few points I'd like to make. Uh, I consider the announcement of bin Laden's death more or less a, a big intelligence failure. We should have tried for at least a month or two to exploit any intelligence. Also, uh, why have they never considered air, well, you know they have uh, geostationary satellites. Why not have determined the choke points on the infiltration routes into Afghanistan and destroyed them? Well, on the first one, I, I think there's room for disagreement, sir. I think your point is, is, is uh, um, a valid one, a valid basis for debate. My own view is that uh, bin Laden was of a nature that we would not have gotten anything and if we spent two months and then had to try him in, in Guantanamo or wherever and given, given him a, foreign, a forum for his eloquence in the Muslim world, I think there was a great downside to it. Um, the second answer to your question is uh, we don't let the military, they used to say let Reagan be Reagan, we don't let the military be the military. If anybody believes that we have seen 10 percent of what the U.S. military can do in terms of destruction and bringing victory to the United States. Uh, they're crazy. There's an enormous amount we could have done. We could have protected our troops, for example, by spreading landmines all along the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. But we're more comfortable with dead American soldiers and dead Marines than disturbing this anti-mine effort that was led by, you know, that half-brained, half British Princess Diana. Um, we're in an odd, odd position where we're let, letting our Marines and soldiers get killed because we don't mind, because we don't want to upset people who, who don't like landmines. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy situation that we're in, sir. 
as part of these 17 letters by and to bin Laden, which total about 175 pages. We don't know the author. It could have been bin Laden. It could have been somebody else. But when asked about al-Qaeda, we thought it was interesting to share with you and with our audience. Uh, as part of these documents, uh, this is uh, what it says, quote, the name al-Qaeda reduces the feeling of Muslims that we, are, that we belong to them and allows the enemies to claim deceptively that they are not at war with Islam and Muslims, but they are at war with the organization of al-Qaeda. Yes. Why is this important? Well, it's important because for two things. First, uh, al-Qaeda's real name is al-Qaeda uh, uh, of jihad, uh, the base of jihad. And now, in short, for short parlance in newspapers and in the press, it's just called al-Qaeda, which leaves out the universal part of it, the jihad part of it, which would appeal to all Muslims. Uh, and so the re restoration of that name would certainly be helpful. They, if you read that memo, they're very conscious of how the media works and how people perceive things. Just as important, though, is it gives you a good idea that um, al-Qaeda as an organization was very much a modern multi multi, uh, uh, multinational corporation. You could almost it reminded me the discussion of should we change our brand of uh, Coca-Cola's problem. After they introduced the new Coke and nobody liked it, they had to go back to Coca-Cola Classic to restore their image and to get, get the product sold. And basically that's the kind of thing that that, that, that letter was talking about, was we need, to, we need to get this focus off of just us as an organization and get it back to, the, to where we want it to be, which is an organization that's leading and inspiring the Muslim world as a whole. Next call is Daniel joining us from Winnipeg in Canada. Welcome to the program, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your program. I'm a former uh, officer from uh, Iranian Army. I have a question, as uh, uh, our dear friend told us, we have Islam and uh, Islam. But uh, I have a question about, you know, about uh, the Quds forces. We hear many things about Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. What is the place of Quds forces? Because, as you know, the Quds forces from Iran give so many protection and financial support and technical and information to so many different terrorist organizations. Can you please share with us what you know about that? Because I hear about, as you know, that, for example, the uh, people who did uh, the terrorist attack on 9-11 at all, it was uh, for two weeks in Iran, disappeared in Iran. What happened? What he has done there? Yeah, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not aware of Atta being in, in uh, Iran. Uh, the Quds force of the Iranians is their elite part of their revolutionary guards. It is involved in nefarious activities and uh, Iranian defense activities around the world. Uh, I think, you know, ultimately we'll, we'll be going to war with Iran if the Israelis want us to, and, and uh, I guess that'll take care of that problem. But uh, I'm not your expert on that, sir. I really don't know much about the Quds Force at all, except that uh, they're very talented and, and uh, a very, a very much a thing worth worrying about. A follow-up, since the uh, viewer was from Iran originally, but phoning in from uh, Winnipeg, Canada, Sidney Moore wondering, are you saying that bin Laden considered Iran as an enemy, and what does this imply about U.S. policy? Well, there is, there is uh, certainly there was, bin Laden comes right out in the documents and says we can never trust the Iranians. But there's also a discussion, there's obviously discussions going on between um, Iran and Al-Qaeda over the fate of bin Laden's family, which was held in uh, Iran. Uh, I th what it says about U.S. policy is basically that Iran uh, is a country in a lot of trouble. Um, it's an island of Shias in a Sunni world that would rather kill them than kill us. Its economy is declining because its oil production and energy production is in decline. And uh, they're surrounded by American military bases. In a, in, a, in a more rational world, that's the kind of country you would look at as a potential ally or at least not as an enemy. But we have not really changed um, our attitude toward the Iranians since the hostage incident. And the politicians use that as a, as a means to keep driving us toward what would be an absolutely disastrous war with Iran. 
Our guest headed up the CIA bin Laden unit from 1996 until 1999. Michael Scheuer is here at the table. A follow-up from an interview that we conducted earlier here on C-SPAN. Is the first wife and the fourth son available to testify? C-SPAN's Susan Swain interviewing a journalist who wrote their story of leaving bin Laden. They left before 9-11. Yeah, is that, I can't remember the lady's name, but it's really quite a wonderful book, Growing Up Bin Laden, I think it was called. And um, a, a, a book that I used extensively in my biography of Osama Bin Laden, and uh, a very, very interesting first-hand testimony. Another uh, piece of evidence, if people in the United States wanted to read it, uh, of how mischaracterized uh, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and their goals have been. Um, uh, bin Laden in particular is portrayed by his wife and his son, and his son doesn't like him uh, very much, as a man who was willing to sacrifice whatever for, for his faith. Um, a man who put a tremendous amount of time into leading the organization, into learning how to speak correctly, and in, into putting his own life at risk in fighting. So uh, it's a book that's very worth reading if people really want to understand the enemy. John is on the phone. Capitol Heights, Maryland, good morning. Good morning, and thank you for your guest. I mean, he's about the first person I've ever heard on C-SPAN, so I've been listening for quite a few years since 9-11 that has any idea of what's really going on, because normally you have the same old beat-up, beat-down politicians and the Army generals speaking the same old crazy stuff, but to hear this guy come with a breath of fresh air, but Thank there you, was sir. there was several things there were several points I'd like to make and get his response to. Number one, our government in that part of the world is looked at a government without justice and without any real religion. That's number one. Number two, I think bin Sa Osama bin Laden, Gaddafi, and and also uh, Saddam Hussein, all these guys should have been brought to trial. But the reason they were not brought to trial is because they would have been the guys to really wake the American people up to what our government is really doing over there in that part of the world. Now, this gentleman is bringing out a lot of points, but the people who could have really woke us up, not from our own government, this guy is just a little light in the dark, but the reason they had to be killed, oh, now he's saying ben, uh, Mr. Mr. Osama bin Laden would have been speaking to the Islamic world. Well, they already knew what he had to say. They knew his doctrine, his ideology, and his philosophy. John, thanks for the call from Maryland. Well, you might have a good point there. Uh, but the, the, the ability of um, the mainstream media to twist what, uh, in, in excerpt and cut what bin Laden was saying, uh, you know, you would probably had to tune into Al Jazeera or somewhere else to get the whole, the whole gist of it. We, our media, our politicians are intent on making Americans afraid of, uh, you know, this uh, bogeyman of, uh, the Islamists coming to invade Milwaukee or Atlanta or something. Um, I think, unfortunately, that that I still come down to the idea that Bin Laden is better off dead than speaking to the Muslim world. Um, the, and the Americans don't need uh, any more from Osama Bin Laden to understand what this war is about. Uh, we have not had an enemy since General Giap and Ho Chi Minh who have been so eloquent and frequently spoken and clearly spoken about what their grievances were, what they intended to do about them, and how they intended to beat us. Uh, bin Laden laid it out consistently since the mid-1990s, and yet the American people have had very little opportunity to read what he said. The only thing that was ever quoted in the media was uh, something that could be framed as a threat. Let me conclude, again, these are the words of Bin Laden, and this came about from his writings uh, a year ago on the 10th anniversary of September 11th. Attached, he wrote, with this message is a visual statement to the American people that I hope a copy to be given to the international Al Jazeera and to Arab Al Jazeera. I also hope for it to be translated voiceover to English and to be delivered to Al Jazeera channel prior to the anniversary of 9-11 to be broadcast during it. Just gives you a sense of what he was thinking of. Very much, sir. If you, when you read these letters, at least the ones written by him, they're very conscious of media operations, of, con, of, of appealing to the next generation of young Muslims. And again, as we talked about when we looked at the little video of bin Laden watching himself, oral communication is extraordinarily important in the Muslim world. And uh, that's what he was looking for there. Will more documents be coming out? You know, I don't know. This, is, this to me, was... Uh, 
from from a, from a politician's viewpoint, this is a foolish batch of documents to let go, especially the ones that were written by bin Laden, because they disprove virtually everything. President Obama or John Brennan or Senator McCain or Lindsey Graham, whatever they've said about him as a madman, as a killer, as a terrorist, as a, having nothing to do with Islam, one of the main features of these documents is bin Laden's effort to get his his organization to stop attacks in all places that would kill innocent Muslims. So the idea that somehow he's out there killing left and right, which is what our, our, our politicians want you to believe, is disproved by the documents they released. It's very odd. I wonder if they read these things beforehand. You've written two books. Is there another one in the works? Well, I just I published one last year. I published a, a biography of Osama bin Laden with Oxford University Press, and that just came out in paperback with a, with a new foreword. Next year, I'll have a book from Oxford on the Founding Fathers and non-intervention and how our, our failure to abide their guidance on non-intervention has landed us in a great deal of problems, especially in the Middle East. Author and for more than two decades at the CIA, heading up the Bin Laden unit from 1996 to 1999, Michael Scheuer, thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure, sir, always. Please come back again.